Hey, hi everyone. Now, welcome to your show, eCoffee with Experts. This is your host, Anmay here. And today we have Rory Mason, who is the Managing Director at 21 Degrees Digital with us. Hey, Rory, how's it going? Not bad, not bad. Thank you very much for having me. Lovely. Rory, before we move any forward, let's get to know the human behind the mic. Why don't you talk us through your journey, how were you as growing up, and how did you land up in the digital marketing, SEO space, and also about your agency, 21 Degrees Digital, what do you guys specialize in, what are core competencies, and we take it off from there. Wow. How long do you have? We <laughs> <laughs> got time, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. My journey was interesting. As a kid, I really wanted to be a director. That's all I wanted to be. And I nearly left school just thinking I could go work in TV. So I went to work in TV. And this was in the uh, the mid noughties when indie music was bursting everywhere. And so being somebody that's uh, got ADHD, I wasn't, I had no idea at the time, but then when all of a sudden distracted by music and went to work in the music industry where I got a job as a music, in a music venue that ended up being a marketing manager and it got me into music. Uh, It got me into that that industry and was great, but I then started getting, falling in love with marketing. So moved into PR from there as like my career is very checkered, try everything. And then from PR, what I discovered was you'd have people saying the, so what questions me? So they'd hire you to get an article in the, in, in the, the Yorkshire post or in the telegraph and they'd turn around and say, well, that's great. But how many Hoovers does this sell me? And you go, well, come on, this is this. So what I worked out at the time was it was an exciting time when PR was being rolled into mm-hmm. SEO. And I found right. a way of saying, actually, no, this link that you've got from the Telegraph has actually increased your rankings and was able to use SEO to answer the show what question about PR. And that's how I got into uh, mm-hmm. the world of digital, the being a bit of a geek, really, and just hyper-focusing and going down um, all sorts of avenues. Right. And then... That took me on to being, I ended up being head of social media for a company called Search Laboratory, which was was amazing. And then I set out into my own freelance journey and ended up setting up like an agency called Ground Up Digital, which was a social enterprise. We, the idea is we hired people who struggle because of neurodiversity to get into the workplace. And, um, yeah, no, that was, and that was fantastic. But then from there, from there, I ended up merging with another company called 21 Degrees, which is my company now, because we were... At the time, we were offering web, SEO, PPC. They were offering social media management, graphic design, and video. And we were just working so closely together. It made sense just to merge, just to merge the two businesses and go forward as one. Mm-hmm. And we haven't looked back since. It's been one of the best decisions I ever made. And my business partners are incredible. Lovely. Quite a journey, I must say. And yeah. you did work with Sony and SuperDry, like mm-hmm. big brands, right? So how was your experience there? And how it helped with your own agency? So that's, that experience. it's a really interesting question. The working with brands like Superdry, I helped run Superdry's PR campaign, uh, SEO PR across Europe. And mm-hmm. that was really interesting because again, big teams learning lots about how to, why doing PR in different countries with, with, with other, I've worked on campaigns for O2, I've worked for Viking Direct. And um, these big agents, these big companies, they really care about brand. They really care about making sure that you're delivering KPIs to a really high standard. And so I learned to jump higher and to be more organized and to make sure that I was stepping up to that sort of professional standard. Because when you're pitching to the super dry board in the super dry boardroom, it, it is very nerve wracking. So I learned something amazing, but the techniques that I learned using for big brands, I've then able to take to smaller companies because it, for me, the, a lot of this seems like a dark art and it seems in terms of the, your approach to digital and how you do it, smaller brands just feel they can't ex- access it. So actually taking those learnings and then passing them on, creating a smaller agency by design because we're much more nimble, we're much more able to collaborate across the department and then saying, but that's the level of standard that I know Superdry and Sony are getting. There's no reason why a company with that's just turning over, just started to turn over seven figures shouldn't get that same access. Absolutely. And you spoke about the merger earlier, right? The mergers are quite fascinating. Someone in it will understand the challenges and all the headaches that kind of comes with it. So what were some of the biggest challenges within the merger of 21 degrees and ground? And also, what were the initial rewards that you got out of the merger? Oh, great question. So the, in terms of the merger, the biggest challenge was definitely bringing two completely separate teams that worked in yeah. completely different ways. 
and saying, sticking them all in one office and going, guys, get on. <laughs> it, it, obviously, we, there was a lot of TLC and a lot of kind of making sure, but we, what we found out in, instantaneously was there was a very us and them mentality. Mm-hmm. And so we had to, we even sat down with the te- sit down with the teams and saying, do you realize that you're talking about the ground up lot or the 21 lot? Or they, there was, it was making sure that those teams start to seamlessly work. But one of the biggest rewards that we had was we had, two sets of clients, essentially, that when we pulled everything together and we turned around and said, we all our video clients, we turned around and said, we can now offer web design and SEO and this. They were just, they, they're brilliant. We trust you for video. We'll start using you for that. Similarly with the SEO yeah. clients and PPC clients, we could turn around and say, we can now do video. And the mixing of yeah. that together for our clients meant it was more than just upselling one client list. It was everybody benefit all our clients benefiting from having a better service yeah. and people they trust yeah it was an interesting journey and i'd say in terms of getting the teams together it took us at least six months to a year for everybody to feel fully 21 or as a single team but once you go through that and you take the time to really understand on a human by human level what their challenges right. are why they're thinking this way you when you bring the team forward it's so rewarding Absolutely. Now that you're one, how do you now differentiate your agency's offerings from your competitors? Because you and me understand there's so many agencies now, right? So it is a crowded marketplace. So what is like the monthly, you know, stay unique to what you're doing? Well, it's, it's a, again, really good question because I think there's something like 4,000 agencies in Leeds alone. And when you're, okay. and when basically number. you're, you're all selling Google ads, you're all selling people, you're all, yeah. all selling web, <laughs> WordPress websites. It's really hard for you to different, differentiate yourself. And there's two ways that we, there's two ways that we do it. Firstly is through our service level. And I know that's a yeah. easy thing to say, because again, that requires you to have a lot of trust, but a lot of our work comes from word of mouth because of that service level and looking after our customers. We're like, and one of the things I love is when we come in after a bad agency, if somebody's had a bad experience, Perfect. It's always hard to convince them to trust you, but we've had comments where the people have turned around to us and said, your agency's done more work in a week than my yeah. last agency did in six months that they were the last six months of our contract. And again, right. we that just helps us really because they understand what bad looks like. They now see what good looks like. And it means yeah. that they, those clients just stay and we, we never lose those clients because they love that level of service. Mm-hmm. But the second thing that separates us is really what an agency for me is our team. And without your team, without your staff, you you have nothing but you sat behind a desk trying to do Google ads or trying to do a pit development and uh, sell something. And so one of the things that we've got a mission to is to be the most inclusive agency in the UK. And this comes through from a, from anything in terms of our staffs. And um, main, my main focus is neurodiversity because I've got ADHD and dyslexia. And so we nurture and encourage staff that think differently in that way. But also only 6% of the advertising industry is represented by the BAME community. And over 50% of our staff come from, uh, come from BAME communities. So really, we are trying to look at our staff and think, our staff, if our staff are diverse and they're diverse thinkers, then that's exactly what your audience is like. And so yeah. you don't want a bunch of middle-aged white men sitting there and telling you how to sell cosmetic products or something like that. We represent much better your audience and so therefore can give you a much better service and come up with ideas that are going to resonate with your audience better. So those are the two ways that we try and stand out. Have you said no to a client ever? You must have at some point. So give us that story. Oh, I've fired clients before. Um, oh, okay. One step ahead. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I've had some fire. Like, because again, it, you get those certain clients that know that if they shout the loudest, they can get the most. Yeah. But the problem is that then comes at detriment to the nice, lovely clients that we work with. And also our staff. Again, I was talking before in my previous answer about how we look after our staff. So if I've got a client that is regularly ringing up and giving a dr- an absolute dressing down to one of my staff for what I feel is no reason, I don't feel that that client deserves to work with us. And so I have rung up and said, I rung up and said, I absolutely said to clients, if you feel like that's my client, my team again, I will absolutely, we will terminate the contract. And yeah. really, in terms of the story that you're looking for, we had one client and he would just, 
it, everything would be, you'd get the scope, you'd get it quoted, and then he'd just be like, it would be more and more. And then he'd ask that, you'd tell, we'd say everybody gets three three rounds of revisions. And we were on like revision 20. And I just turned yeah. around and said, you know, we, we don't need this. We don't need to, we, we don't need this anymore. It's, it's take you taking too much time. And again, he was just so unpolite about it. Everything was a chore. Everything was there. Didn't really understand what he bought. Thought he could use his weight to throw everyone and shove everyone around. And again, we ask for, at the end of the day, for us and our clients, we're there because we truly care about making their results improve. And if they, and, and as a result, they, we like it when our clients, we, we want our clients to see them as part of our marketing team. We want them to see us as an extension of their goals, not somebody that they have to work against and can just shout because they're paying us some money. That's not who we are. Absolutely. And talking about client relationship, what is your secret to building those long lasting and successful client relationships? Oh, my say, I love getting people excited. And really making them think about the optimistic future, because that's, again, that's what we're here to do, to build, to build and help them grow their companies. And sometimes one of my favorite things to do is to sit down with our client, some of our key clients every six months and say, what's the next six months look like for you? How do we plan this out? How do, where are your goals? What are we doing? How do we get excited? And, and then saying, these are the sorts of things that we can do and really taking that time. But also the real other key is actually listening to them. Because if you turn around and get, I get them all excited at the start of that meeting and they say, well, do you know what, mate, we're struggling a bit now. We're having to cut marketing budgets, cut, do everything. And I'm going, but you need a PPC campaign on top of you. Oh, that just doesn't work. So it's really understanding and being there for them and, and jumping as and when are the right moments. And, and again, managing, managing expectations as well, I think is a, just as a complete aside to throw in there is being yeah. realistic about what you can achieve because Anybody, the times when I have tried to promise the world to clients, it always ends up biting me back. So, Absolutely. Yeah. And the promise over deliver is the same. Yeah, exactly. I, exactly. And the amount of times when I've been being like, oh, I'm going to do these extra five hours because they'll really appreciate that. And then they just look at it as in, oh, it's nice. But they don't appreciate the fact that you stayed, you stayed up till two in the morning um, yeah. doing stuff and, and, and getting beat because you didn't communicate the value of what you were doing beforehand. So yeah. setting those expectations, clear communication and getting yeah. them excited is my, would be my in a nutshell answer. Absolutely. We also believe in the retention starts from the moment you have told the client with that pitch, with that first pitch you made. If you've understood what do they need and is it exactly what you offer and you're good at it, your client will be retained until unless you really goof mm -hmm. it up. Yeah. But if you know that you've sold something which you're not an expert at or probably have not understood the requirements correctly today or tomorrow, three months down the line, this is going to pop up. And obviously after that, like you mentioned, important pointers, clear communication, setting the expectations, right? You know, these are like crucial, I would say, milestones during the journey of that, that client. Having the proper weekly, monthly, fortnightly calls in place and setting the expectations, it is quite crucial. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, talking about neurodiversity, right? So how can businesses leverage neurodiversity to create more inclusive and effective marketing campaigns as per you? So that is a fantastic question because the thing is about neurodiversity is so little understood yeah. in terms of the, some of the people that estimate as many as 20% of the UK could be neurodiverse in some way, shape or form. And that's, I see so many people out there that kind of think that they're, think that they're a bit bonkers or something along those lines and they have these traits and they just don't understand. The key to neurodiversity is the fact that the creative, if you can latch on to creativity, you can latch on to hyper-focus and see. So for example, for me, I can shut myself in a room and just or, well, sit down on my computer and just work and work and figure out a problem. And I will sit there until even if the lights have gone out and everything, everybody's gone home and I won't notice anything else going around me because I'm focused on that problem. And if you can, if you, but then the problem is, is that might burn me out in order to do it. Mm -hmm. So I've got to make sure that I'm then going, okay, we've got flexible working hours work really well for someone with neurodiversity. So you can have that hyper-focus, you can go down those rabbit holes, you can get that true value because you set somebody like me, that, that task, I'm going to find the answer for you because my brain will literally not let me not find it for you. And But then we also need to, in, and that might mean I work late one night, but then that means that I need a bit of time off the next morning and it's having that flexible working hours 
utilizing that and understanding what your staff's mm-hmm. strengths are, but more importantly, what their weakness is. And that's one thing I find really interesting about when we hire, because I'm really interested in what they're not good at. And I'm interested in what yeah. they're not good at because A, we can put provisions in place to stop that from happening. B, we right. can talk to other members of staff because you might have a member of staff that's not good at analyzing data, but you might have another member of staff who is. So get the member of staff who is good at analyzing data, analyzing all the data and get graphic design, graphic design being done by the other person because their skills, skills, strengths and weaknesses will balance. And if you can understand that about your staff, whether neurodiverse or not, you can create a truly rounded team that complement each person complements one another. And the neurodiversity right. style of thing, that's really important because understanding those strengths and weaknesses not only could help them and empower them, but then also enables that level of creativity and, and flourish of control, which just then is it, on a marketing campaign can just be invaluable. Absolutely. Absolutely. And as someone who has lived, various digital marketing teams and agencies and with direct brands as well. What are some of the key leadership lessons that you have learned and how do you implement it at your own agency? I think, I always find it funny because I don't, you, you, as a leader, I'm, I, I just don't, sorry, I've not answered this one very well at all. As a leader, I never feel like I am a leader. Like I just set up an agency and people come around me and people come to me and ask me for things. So it always, sometimes it just shocks me that people consider me as a leader. But I, as you point out, I have built multiple companies and I have led multiple yeah. marketing teams. But I think yeah. the thing is being humble and being open to ideas. Because if you can lead your team, chances are, are 10 times better than you at most of the things that you do. And if you can understand that, then again, it's about understanding where their strengths and weaknesses are, listening to them and guiding them on the journey and just letting them know that you're there for them. And then letting them flourish, having that space of being like, you've got the tools, give them a little nudge, off you go. And and I have a much more laid, you know, laid back. I trust my staff to go off and uh, to go off and do the work and deliver the work. They know the expectations. And then it's just a case of that's it. I, I think I feel, to summarize where I've started, I feel more I'm a guide than a leader, so to speak, because really I feel most of the time they teach me stuff. Lovely. I'm glad you mentioned that. You learn so much from your team when and around because they come with so much of expertise and, you know, their own skill sets, right? So I really love that part. So, and in talking about 2024, I mean, we've already seen, you know, the end of 2023 with the AI technology and all always there, you know, but we kind of, you know, so uh, what are most exciting marketing trends that you are seeing in 2024 and how can businesses leverage them? I think for me, the real lean into EEAT from yeah. an SEO perspective is that's the most exciting thing because that with the creation of a lot of this spammy AI bot link building Correct. generate. 20,000 pages in a day. It was, I was really worried about where the internet was going. And in one core update, one single beautiful core update, Google just thrust away all the rubbish. And so I'm really excited about the way that we're talking about how all brands and people are coming to the table and they're talking about wanting to show their expertise, to show their skill, to really demonstrate their knowledge, but from a place of understanding. I think that is going to make the internet a much richer place because there's a reason there's a reason we all lean into Reddit heavily for everything because right. that's where people go to tell their stories. And if we can now take EAT, build it into beautiful stories, you're going to have a really good brand. That's I love the fact that's a cornerstone of the internet at the moment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Beautiful, Rory. This has been a fantastic conversation, a lot of insights there. But before we let you go, a quick rapid fire. A quick rapid fire. Go for it. All right. Your last Google search. Oh, it was Manalord's patch update. Okay. First paycheck. So, oh, it was a ski shop in Otley. Okay. Your next vacation. Oh, I am going to London next week uh, with my kids. I'm really excited. Lovely. Lovely. And your celebrity crush. Ooh, oh, God. Do you know what? Her name's... Easy for you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. her name's just... Uh, <laughs> she, she's the girl from Hunger Games. That one, I can't remember. I'm terrible with celeb- celebrity names. All right. I oh, will not give you any further, yeah? <laughs> Thank you so much, Rory, for taking out time to do this with us. Really appreciate it, yeah? And for audiences, if they want to reach out to you, how do they do that? 
You can find me on LinkedIn. That's probably the best place. Or you can go to 21degreesdigital.com and call the number. I'll be on the other end. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you so much, Ari. Cheers, man. Thank you.